So it's my pleasure to open this session on the financial networks, financial in innovation and inequalities. We have uh, two great speakers today uh, with high-level scientific background on a topic that you will see for some of you if you don't have some uh, strong uh, mathematical or physical uh, background, you will see that the topic is not an easy one. Um, financial networks is something that was extremely well known uh, by physicists, a very studied in economics uh, for networks of electricity, for instance, networks of um, emails, uh, but not so much in finance until uh, something happened in 2008. And then suddenly people said, oh, markets are not so efficient and we have to look at things in a different manner. Oh, there are some speculative bubbles. No, it's not a speculative bubble, it's more complicated. And so there is this domino effect. The word domino effect uh, existed way before uh, 2008 crisis, uh, but suddenly people started looking at it. Uh, the impact is very complex, as uh, Stefano uh, will going to tell us. Uh, the impact is very complex and goes uh, to measuring even the value of capital. And for those who haven't read it, I like it seems like people like having some uh, literature reference. I would recommend reading one of the masterpiece of the 20th century, which is Master and Margarita by Bulgakov. The novel was written between 30 and 40. And uh, there is this scene where they are in a theater and the, the master, which is a kind of magic, uh, a bit like the Mephistopheles in, uh, in uh, Goethe. And at some point in his show, there is some money floating from the ceiling. And then people in the audience said, well, but that's real money. So it's real money. It's not was fake money. It was real uh, banknotes. And they started, you know, buying them. They, they come on the stage with uh, Chanel, uh, Diamant Noir, and, uh, and all those ladies, you know, who uh, uh, use that real money that come from the ceiling and buy those luxury goods. Uh, they completely change themselves, you know, they got naked and then put on all those uh, uh, fancy underwear, etc. And of course, at some point, he just does that and the money disappears as well as all those goods that were bought with the money and the lady and naked in the street. <clears throat> uh, the magic of creation and disappearance of values is what we fear when we have all those credit networks that is the heart of the topic that we are going to listen to. So Stefano is, he told me, should I say that I'm a former physicist? I said, well, for me, it's a great thing. I don't know what it is, but believe me, uh, people who have this double view of having hard science on the one hand and understanding economics, uh, like understanding that you are dealing with a living body, uh, uh, for me, uh, that's the best brains uh, I've ever seen. So uh, he's been uh, uh, working, uh, at, he's now a professor at the University of Zurich. Uh, he's part of the Systemic Risk Initiative uh, with, uh, led by uh, Joseph Stiglitz and lots of other things, but I think it's better to let him talk. Okay, so maybe I'll, uh, I'll stand, maybe it's a little bit easier. Okay, <clears throat> well, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be at the INET annual conference. Uh, it's always exciting to be, to be at this conference. There's always lots of exciting discussions. And it is also, I think, a very um, paradigmatic and symbolic uh, event 
uh, during the year because it's a place where um, uh, the economic profession is reflecting, it's one of the places where the economic profession is, re is reflecting upon recent development that are coming uh, from, uh, well, from the discipline itself, but also from interdisciplinary approaches. And this is something that I'm going to uh, be talking about today. Well, first of all, uh, a couple of acknowledgements. I'm a professor of banking at the uh, Department of Banking and Finance, and uh, the topic of my Professorship is precisely financial network analysis in and systemic risk. And I would like to acknowledge the uh, INET program uh, on financial stability, which is led by uh, Joe Stiglitz. And there I'm uh, co chairing the working group on financial networks. And I would also like to acknowledge the European Commission for being quite open about um, applications of complexity into policy. And I'm, in this respect, I'm coordinating two projects on financial networks and sustainability. Um, <clears throat> and um, I'm very happy to, to uh, discuss any further details for, for those who would be, could be interested in this. Now, let me <clears throat> mention that the topic that I'm going to be talking about is actually uh, getting at the core of the policy discussion in many, uh, in many respects. As a summary of what I'm going to say today is, first of all, there is a number of um, efforts in, uh, that are ongoing in trying to incorporate, uh, both in Europe and uh, in the United States, also at the Office of uh, Financial Research, in um, um, incorporating network effects into the current stress test. Um, as an example, the asset quality review and the uh, comprehensive assessment that was released in November last year by the European Central Bank did not contain any type of network effect. It was a major effort, and, uh, uh, but it did not contain any, any network effect, effect so far. And we are currently collaborating with the European Central Bank in trying to uh, improve that and have that in the, in the following years. Um, why should we care about network? Well, in fact, um, and this is a collective effort. Uh, it's, it's not just my work and those of, uh, of my colleagues, my direct colleagues, but there is a whole uh, scientific community that includes both uh, academics and uh, central bankers. And co Pierre uh, here next to me is, uh, is uh, uh, one of the best representative of, of, of this, um, who have been showing that um, network effects do matter. There are different channels by which they matter. Uh, one is balance sheet interlock, so uh, my liabilities are the asset of someone else, uh, common assets, so we have exposure to uh, similar or the same asset classes, and this is related then to the uh, mechanism, well-known mechanism of fire sales. So these are all different mechanisms by which contagion can happen. They are quite different and they have different magnitude, but they all uh, uh, matter and they contribute to the fact that networks not only allow to diversify risk, but also uh, may amplify shocks. And uh, so there's a whole literature about this, and uh, the result is not simply, uh -huh, um, um, aha, net, a given network is better than another one. Reality, in fact, is, is a bit more complicated than that, so you need to de uh, delve into the details of what this literature is bringing about. And uh, connected to the more general title of this session, I would like to say, that the connection to that is that we should realize that the fact that the financial system is so interconnected through different, uh, uh, in different ways, and I'm going to explain, give uh, uh, examples of some of those, uh, leads to the fact, leads to what, to, to what um, <clears throat> uh, economists have been, uh, have been calling the collective moral hazard. So it's actually, it's not just one bank that is too big to fail, but it's the whole financial system that is uh, too big to fail. And that has implications for both what type of financial innovations are actually uh, welfare enhancing and uh, for uh, inequality as well, which has been a topic in the major topic during this, this whole uh, conference. So I will not develop in detail the connections to, the, to both financial innovation and inequality. These are very, uh, difficult connections to formalize mathematically, but I think that the connection will be very clear uh, um, from, from, the, from the slides. So uh, first of all, these slides are showing an example of, uh, <clears throat> of how far we have been going so far 
um, with penetrating the policy discussion with the topic of networks. So interconnectedness, which is just another way of saying um, networks, has been the, the object of this conference uh, focusing on, the, on what kind of uh, insights can we bring from the theory into the policy. And uh, another example is this um, conference, This is Now the Future, it is a con it's a call for, for papers, um, it's a conference that I'm co-organizing at the Banco de Mexico in uh, November, and, um, and will be, there will be also a, an associated uh, a special issue of the Journal of Financial Stability. Um, now, when people talk about the financial system, or more precisely, the banking system, uh, we tend to look at it, I mean, traditionally, we tend to think of it as the aggregate balance sheet of all banks. And one of the things that uh, we tend to neglect is actually that the banking system is connected to other compartments of the financial system, and uh, uh, not only the financial system here. Uh, you, uh, do we have a pointer? No. Okay. Um, so in the picture, uh, you see the uh, other financial institutions, pension and insurance, and then also households and governments. And you can track down, actually this is ECB uh, data warehouse, quarterly, the relative exposures of all these uh, compartments, uh, all these sectors among each other. And what is interesting is that you can even expand the balance sheet, aggregate balance sheet of each of these uh, sectors. And you notice two things in the balance sheet at, at, at my, uh, my, my back, which is first thing, is that the number of loans, the quantity of the amount of loans of the banking system, MFI, monetary financial institutions, to uh, non-financial corporations is down there. Uh, it's actually 4.3 trillion trillions out of 31 trillion, which is the total size of the balance sheet, which is essentially 15%. So this is a topic that came, uh, <clears throat> has been raised by other people during this conference. Uh, you know, the usual story is the banks, what do they do? Well, they receive deposits from households and then they lend to, to the real economy. Well, in fact, that's 15% of the story. There's a lot of other things that are happening and a major part is mortgages. We, we, have, we have heard in one of the sessions in the morning from Lord Turner how important is the um, exposure of the financial system in, uh, let's say, the role in fueling potentially uh, um, uh, asset bubbles. And uh, certainly this is one of the challenges, the, 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 the channels, because uh, uh, the exposure to mortgages is very, is very prominent. And then there's a bunch of other things which are interbank, which is uh, uh, seven trillion, okay? So seven trillion is, is out of 31, is, is a pretty big chunk of the um, average aggregate, let's say, um, uh, balance sheet of banks. And uh, of course, um, what we would like to do, what we, we don't have yet, is some sort of comprehensive assessment of what happens, condition upon a shock on uh, certain asset classes uh, to the banking system and then from the banking system down to the other sectors. Unfortunately, at the moment, um, it, first of all, typically all the stresses we are running don't even include the real economy. So, uh, uh, the breakdown of those uh, uh, loans to non-financial corporations, uh, we don't even consider that in neither direction. And second, we don't even look at the consequences for the other uh, components like the pensions and insurance and so on. So what people typically do is uh, zoom in into that uh, box called uh, MFI and study domino effects or contagion effects within that. And uh, this is a link to the other uh, keyword that is in the title of the session, uh, which is inequality. So what this plot is showing over time, normalized by the level of 2008, uh, what was the uh, relative change in operating revenue of the five sectors that we've seen in the pictures be before. So uh, these are relative changes, okay? So the sum uh, uh, is relative changes uh, with respect to each one. So it's not relative in, uh, in the total. So the sum of the changes doesn't have to be one. And what you notice is that uh, essentially since 2008, everybody's doing quite bad, 
except the financial, the financial sector, which in terms of um, uh, operating revenue have seen increases of up to 30%. Um, now, so what are the motivations of, of what I'm going to uh, present more in detail? Um, the Basel III um, uh, Accords foresee that leverage ratio is going to uh, be taken as an important uh, parameter, and actually there's going to be a cap on how much leverage. And this, this cap is about 33 if you measure it as uh, asset divided by equity, and it's about 3% if you take equity divided by asset. Um, however, um, what people are looking there as is total asset. So again, interactions between individual institutions is essentially neglected. There is another concurrent uh, framework, which is the one that defines the GSIBs, uh, Global Systemically Important Banks, and that <clears throat> uh, 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 comprises as one of the um, criteria to determine whether a bank is a SIBs, uh, is interconnectedness. And their interconnectedness is meant as aggregate exposure from and in, uh, from and to, sorry, the uh, rest of the uh, banking system. So again, this is an important step. It says, okay, this is, there is a, it's essentially aggregating all the linkages that a given bank has uh, to the other banks, uh, but essentially is insensitive to the identity of the counterparties. So I could be, um, you know, uh, uh, some counterparties that are completely irrelevant for the system might be exposed to me, so then if I default, then I, I, I cause a certain impact. But instead, uh, given the same amount of exposure, if very important players are exposed to me, then the impact that I can make is very different. So now, uh, with everything else the same, so with the same amount of, exp of in interconnectedness according to this criteria, I can have a very, very different impact. So this, is, uh, this uh, approach is yet not sensitive to that. So what we're trying and, uh, to do is combining these two approach with a third one. And uh, what I want to mention here is that there is a traditional approach that looks at, it's built upon, uh, building upon the Eisenberg Noy framework, essentially. Um, in there, the default, the event of default, which usually is defined as equity going to zero, uh, you know, that's more complicated than that. In, in, in principle, the default should be when, you, when you're not meeting the obligations, but uh, as a simplification of that, is taken as equity going to zero, uh, uh, below zero. Um, the default is actually the only event that is triggering contagion. And this is a very uh, restrictive hypothesis that leads to the fact that essentially when you, when you run stress tests, you don't see anything. And people have been doing these, these stress tests up to the run of the crisis in 2006 and 2007, and they were concluding, oh, we have a fantastically robust financial system. So now, one of the things that we, we're, we're trying to uh, do here is combine these ideas. So leverage is important, yeah, yes. Then interconnecting is important, yes, but we should actually break it down to the counterparty level, and we should go beyond this default-only framework. The, New framework that is doing this actually exists since 2012. It's a, it's a methodology we developed in 2012, but now we actually r realize that we, we could rephrase it in a much more intuitive way. And this is the debt trank leverage uh, framework, which is uh, developing essentially, is, is um, emphasizing the fact that all of the contagion effects can be described in terms of leverage matrices, which means that essentially you can break down the leverage, which is a ratio between asset and equity by each category of asset. And this category can be both the interbank and various uh, asset classes on some external markets. Okay? So um, in essence, what this paper, which is available on the, on the uh, repository, is doing is uh, uh, building a, a modular stress test framework where you can plug in different things. And the debt rank is, of course, obviously a, uh, how to say, our preferred way of uh, modeling contagion, but you can plug in also alternative ways of modeling contagion, the traditional one using defaults only, and then whoever will uh, develop uh, alternative models in the future. We do need, uh, I think, better model in, in the future. That rank is just uh, uh, first, uh, first contribution. And one of the thing, important things that you can do with this is disentangle what is the so-called first, second, and third round effect. First round effect 
is essentially when banks are hit directly by shocks. Second round is when they're hit because their counterparties are hit. And third round is then when they start reacting and uh, uh, selling, selling um, assets. And this uh, 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 produces a pressure on prices down, which is then like having, a sec like, like having again, another shock. Um, let me uh, jump to some, uh, some pictures. Otherwise, it's going to be it's too boring. Uh, well, first of all, uh, we are developing a sort of a dashboard that is trying to monitor systemic risk, at least for the moment, a quarterly um, frequency, but um, can actually be done um, even daily if you plug in data from market capitalization. And uh, so this presentation is not interactive, so I cannot show you um, how to use the, the dashboard, but you can select banks and uh, look at the uh, distribution of losses according to certain scenarios and uh, figure out the, the difference between um, uh, um, losses at, at the first round and losses at the second round and compute value at risk at the first round and in the second round. And one of the results is that actually when you uh, bring in these network facts, the, the value at risk can increase very substantially. Now, let me give an illustration of the one of the main motivation, why, why did we uh, come up with this, with this methodology? Well, if you use the traditional default only cascade, uh, these data are showing, um, are, are obtained, these, these are um, counterfactual uh, exercise obtained on, the, on a data set of the largest borrowers from the Fed in the period 2008, 2010. And uh, um, the uh, ticks are trading days, and the period is between 2008 and 2010. Then the peak that you see there is when the market capitalization of the uh, banking system in the United States and in Europe dropped to a minimum that was March 2009. And then it bounced back, also thanks to the fact that the, the Fed was uh, starting various um, uh, repurchasing uh, programs and rescue programs. So um, what you see there is that essentially there is signal only very close to the you know, in a very close window, very close to the, to the uh, peak of, the, uh, of March 2009, and you see only brown. In fact, there, there are 22 curves, but you only see brown. That means you only see some of them. There are also a lot of uh, blue curves that are not visible. What, what does it mean? Well, it means that, in fact, uh, institutions that are, uh, so in the, in the, in the run-up of the crisis, um, uh, small institutions are not systemically important. Only the very big ones are systemically important. Now, this other picture shows, okay, let's try to use some ready off-the-shelf network measures like eigenvector centrality. Everybody's fond about eigenvector centrality, but it's not designed to measure the losses that a, a, a bank causes to the system. It's, it's measure, it's, it, it was not, you know, you know it's, device, it's designed for, for, other, for other purposes. It's just mathematical construction. So you see some signal, but it's actually confusing. And this is what you get with, the, with this methodology. You see two things. First of all, there is some signal well before March 2009, and that is because the methodology is, is incorporating the uh, uh, decrease in market capitalization that is, that is occurring before that. But then you see a run-up, a very non-linear run-up of the, of the effect. Um, and uh, at the peak of the, of the crisis, what you see is that uh, you see a lot of blue curves which means also that the uh, banks that before that had a very small impact, now they start having a very significant impact. And when you read 07, it means that 70% of the total equity of these 22 uh, largest borrowers would be wiped out by the default of one single of those guys. And uh, this is, we, you, of course, uh, you don't know the exposure between those guys, so you have, to exp you have to estimate them. Nobody knows them. That's actually part of the problem, I think, in financial, in, in uh, mm, I think it's a big policy problem. And uh, so you can do robustness analysis and you find that this is actually quite, uh, this was done under a very conservative scenario, by the way. So uh, conclusion, you can build uh, this, this index and I'll show you the mathematics of that. Of that. And you can draw diagrams and place the, illustrate the fact that uh, banks that have a larger impact, you can place them in the, in the center. And this gives a notion of centrality, more central, more uh, important. Now, um, 
An interesting thing is that uh, this methodology is one of the five or six uh, uh, methodologies that at least at an experimental level is used uh, at the European Central Bank to, to monitor systemic risk. We are currently collaborating both uh, with the Macroprudential uh, uh, Division and also with the European uh, uh, Systemic Risk Board. And uh, in this picture, which is taken from um, uh, Philip Hartman's presentation, uh, showing in, on the x-axis the total asset of banks and on the y-axis the debt rank, which is this measure of loss imposed to the system by the default of one bank. And what you see is that at, on the far right, uh, banks that have very similar size in terms of total asset, they may have very different impact uh, in terms of losses they cause to the system. And this is precisely due to the fact that the position of, of a bank in the network do matter, does matter, and uh, depending on who your counterparties are, you might have a very different impact. This is why it's important to measure, um, um, well, first of all, to have the, uh, an assessment of what the exposures are, and also not to just simply aggregate things and lose that, uh, that detail. There is a bunch of related work, this, this uh, methodology was um, picked up by several research groups. Uh, so this is just to um, acknowledge and actually thank uh, all, these, all these people who have been working on that. Now, let me give a, a first a um, brief um, illustration of, the, of how the methodology works and then a couple of formulas. Um, so here's how it, the, the mechanics behind. So there is, this representation is a, a set of balance sheets. Um, of banks, and then uh, the one to the to the far yeah thank you to the far left um, is subject is has been uh, experiencing a shock, um, and let's assume in the in the next that recovery rate is zero, okay? and we know that people are still litigating for uh, the recovering the assets of Lehman Brothers, so definitely it's not a, too much of a bad uh, assumption. So now usually. Um, uh, conditional upon that red shock on the asset side of bank uh, uh, one, um, because that is smaller than the equity that the bank has, you see that there is an orange fraction of the equity that that's exactly what is being wiped out, but it's smaller than the total value of the equity, then everything would stop there. Essentially, and nothing, no one else would, would uh, be affected in any way downstream. Now, we know that this story is not very uh, satisfactory. So one uh, working hypothesis is to say, aha, well, this guy has seen 70% of his equity uh, being, being wiped out. Um, he has issued obligations that are in the balance sheet of other banks. So the value of those obligations should go down if we consider market to market. Therefore, uh, the difference between assets and liabilities of the other banks should also go down. So there is a propagation of losses of equity, uh, even though no one is defaulting. And then there are also uh, parallel exposures which can amplify the, the losses. But you see in this particular example that I constructed, there are no defaults, all, and, and yet there's been a substantial uh, loss on equity in, the, in this banking system. Um, Maybe I could skip the formulas, and, uh, uh, but just say that essentially there's one working hypothesis, which is the second formula. It's a little pity we don't have a pointer. Uh, that says that the um, amount of devaluation of the obligation of the obligor is a function of the amount of relative devaluation of the equity, sorry, the amount of the relative loss of equity of that same obligor. So if I lose 50% of my equity, well, my obligation go down. By how much? Well, a function of that 50%. And then we can discuss what models to use for that, and a particular first uh, assessment can, is, is a linear one, okay? So then we'll, the, the loss would be simply proportional. And you can actually argument this with in terms of expected values of the, of the obligation. Um, so, a parallel uh, thing that I want to mention is that you can also use that for common exposure to uh, a certain asset, as a class, and then when there is a shock on that common asset, uh, because of this uh, devaluation of the obligation that everyone is holding from each other, then you have a, 
an amplification of that initial shock, which can be really, really strong. And in this example, everybody defaults at the end of the second round, although at the end of the first round, uh, no one is defaulting. Okay? Of course, this, I, I constructed this example, but um, let me go to the, to the, to the um, uh, exercise. So uh, we've been using this particular, of course, so the recipe is clear. If you have um, exposure data, which central banks do have, so we have done this exercise actually on the Italian uh, um, central, central bank data. Uh, we did analyze uh, with Copier actually uh, uh, data from the German uh, central bank, from the Deutsche Bundesbank, but we didn't run this particular exercise, this particular debt rank for <coughs> reasons I, for other reasons. But anyway, so if you have the recipe, if you have the, if you have the data, the recipe is very clear. What we have been doing here in addition is actually ex um, estimating the exposures between the largest uh, uh, banks, European banks that are quoted on the, on the stock market. And um, so you find the details of that in the, in the paper. Um, and we actually do, we generate uh, samples, Monte Carlo samples of networks that are coherent with the, the balance sheet constraints so of how much every bank is actually lending and borrowing, which is declared in the balance sheet uh, uh, quarterly. So, um, well, let me sk skip to, to this. Probably this is the most uh, important thing. The critical dimension that we need to look at is not just how much a bank is fragile or how much a, what is the impact, the systemic importance of a bank, but you should look at those two dimensions in conjunction. Why? Well, because if you see on the left, this is, what, this is the picture from 2008, there is a lot of banks, large banks, the size is total asset, which were sitting in the um, top right quart, uh, quadrant. And that quadrant, it means that banks are vulnerable. That means that conditional upon shocks uh, on the system, they lose a lot of their equity. And again, the number goes from zero to one. That's the fraction of equity that they lose conditional upon the shock. Um, and the y-axis is actually telling conditional upon their default how much impact they, they, they cause to the, they make to the rest of the system, which is measured in, dollar, in euros. Uh, as, a frank, as a fraction of the uh, amount of equity that there is in the banking system, how much do they, uh, uh, how much losses do they um, impose? Okay. So, and then you see that in 2013, the picture has completely, has dramatically changed. So, this is a tool that allows you to monitor how things evolve over time. Uh, I don't think we should be too optimistic about the fact that everything now is, is, has moved to the uh, uh, bottom left quadrant. In fact, and maybe Copier is going to be talking about this, there's been also migration of risk and exposures. And uh, so um, the lesson we draw is that, yes, we can monitor systemic risk to a certain extent, but we should also keep an eye on where the risk is, is, is actually going. Um, these are the pictures to show that you can combine the network approach with more traditional risk measures like the value at risk. We know that there's a lot of you know, debate and limitations about the, 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 the <clears throat> uh, notion of value at risk, and uh, Imre has something, would have something to say about it. Uh, but yet, this is one very commonly used measure, so it's important that we can offer that as a tool. And what you see here is these are for uh, two particular, two specific banks. Um, now, this is the global one. This is for two specific different banks of, that have a similar first order value at risk, but quite different second order value at risk. And of course, the second order value at risk, because it contains the network effect, is, is further to the right than, than the first. So um, these are representation of the largest 20. Uh, banks and their exposures, I'm done. Um, and uh, which you, uh, it's a particular realization of one of these many networks that you can construct that are consistent with the, with the balance sheet. And interestingly, now there is some effort to collect uh, exposure between banks at a cross-border level within Europe. But um, uh, to me, is one of the big puzzles. Uh, uh, systemic risk is one of the places where we mostly 
needy, we would mostly need detailed information and where we have, uh, it's, it's more, more difficult to, to have this, this, uh, this information that would allow us to assess systemic risk. So in conclusion, I think this is a, an attempt uh, and is part of a collective effort of many people, including people who are uh, regularly attending the, the, the INED conference, in trying to enri enrich the, the current, the state of the art of stress tests with, uh, uh, by combining network effects into that. Why should we do it? Well, because when you do so, even under very conservative uh, um, hypothesis, you immediately realize that the second order effect is typically at least as big as the first. So I, I, can, discuss, I can discuss that more in detail in the, in the, in the question uh, session, but essentially the second order effect is um, as big as the first simply because the, um, the leverage that banks have among each other is, of all, is between one and two on average, which means that conditional upon a shock on a counterparty, I get that the, the, sh the, the loss that this bank is, exposed, is, is, um, is subject to will hit me multiply by a factor one, two. Okay, and then, so it's it, its own exposure time and its own leverage time my leverage, okay? So this is the reason why you have that and not to mention if you start also including fire sales. Fire sales is, is a very, potentially a very big source of amplification. Um, yeah, so I think this is, uh, okay, yeah, maybe one, one 30 seconds. Um, one of the critiques to this type of approach, and I subscribe to that, is that it's essentially a very static approach. You consider a snapshot of the situation of the banking system, and uh, it's a photography at a particular, it's a picture at a particular day, and then condition upon a shock, you try to uh, assess what is the uh, winding up of those effects given the current state, uh, structure of the balance sheets and not having any reaction and any optimization of the banks. Um, that's true. Now, the good, the good side about it is that precisely because you don't make any assumption on the behavior, this is simply a lower bound of what can happen. And because you can argue that a lot of the um, herding behavior that can happen, in particular through fire sales, but uh, uh, other other mechanisms as well in terms of bank run that you know banks might run on their counterparties in terms of uh, uh, liquidity hoarding and so on will very likely just amplify these effects. Okay, so uh, to me this is a, quite a strong argument to take seriously these numbers that are that are that are coming from these uh, from these estimates, and um, and of course in general we would need to discuss then how. Can this relate to more general equilibrium type of models and estimation, and in particular also with the literature on uh, agent-based models that uh, many of the people in, uh, in this conference are, are dealing with? So I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> so the, the, the speaker's dilemma is that he likes to speak, but also he likes to have time for questions, and he has to balance the two. So, uh, good, you're not too greedy for speaking. We still have time for a few questions. Should, should we have them at the end? Or uh, you want to put them at the end? Or well, so if, we you, if you think that the two are very related, then yeah, so maybe we pass directly. Okay, so, okay, now, so let me introduce. Um, is uh, originally from South Africa. Um, uh, lives in Germany, works for the, uh, the, the Deutsche Bundesbank, uh, so the central bank uh, of Germany, and uh, also has studied uh, also with background in physics and uh, has studied uh, those problems related to the risk of freezing of financial networks. Uh, like you know the the fact that uh, institutions uh, protect each other, but once you have a network of institutions protecting each other, you get the fragility, as you said, as too big to fail as a network. Yeah. So, uh, Copier. Okay. okay. 
thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here. Since I work at Deutsche Bundesbank, the usual disclaimer applies, which states that all views are my own, not those of Deutsche Bundesbank, or because my co-author Sylvia Gabrielli is at, here at the Banque de France in Paris. It's neither their views nor the views of the ECB or the euro system. So everybody is trying to distance them from the paper. And what we do is we, we take a network view on interbank market freezes because we were very fortunate to get um, very covenant data on actual transactions between banks. So we, we know the actual exposures that banks have to one another at any point in time um, on a tick level basis. And the reason we got them was because I'm part of the uh, euro system's macroprudential research network. So the core of what we are looking at in this paper is the development of the interbank market around, around the Lehman insolvency. When you think back in time in, in 2008, and if you follow the news at that time, there was major concerns about a market freeze, banks not being able to get liquidity, um, and there was even one economist title that says, is this the end of capitalism? So because the lack of access to funding um, and the access to liquidity could have brought down the, the banking system as a whole, which in its size was... Uh, uh, could not have been supported by the, by the nation states themselves. So that was a real risk at that time. And it all came in, at the heart of the matter um, from the US. And in, when you look at Europe, the heart of the problem was uh, the perceived breakdown of interbank markets. So what we are looking at is uh, the cessation of financial intermediation. And when I, when I looked at the literature, um, I, I went back a bit in history to find the first author that, that wrote about this, and actually that's in, in Shakespeare. Where, where Polonius in Hamlet says, neither a borrower nor a lender be for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing does the edge of husbandry. So I, I can't compete with, with Rob Johnson's lyrics, but that's, that's as far as, as, we can, as we can go for people who thought about financial intermediation. And we ask in the papers how Polonian have banks become following the Lehman insolvency. So let me give you four reasons why interbank markets uh, are so important, particularly in the euro area. And I think that's the best, best way to start, to first tell you why the thing we are studying actually matters. Um, the, Stefan already mentioned it in his talk briefly, but they are really the key source of liquidity for banks in the euro area. 20 to 25% of banks' balance sheet in aggregate come directly from the interbank market, both on the asset and the liability side. That's a massive amount. Compared to the US, uh, where it's only a few percent, it's a huge part of liquidity that depends on unsecured borrowing. Uh, running, out of this, running out of this funding can be very costly because there are fire sales. Uh, and if you run out of funds and you have to roll over debt or your depositors are withdrawing, the only way you can do is you can liquidate some of your assets. And if, the, if there's a crisis around the corner, this can be very costly. So there's a, there's a spiral, um, a liquidity spiral that can drain all your equity and can lead to huge losses that eventually are much more dangerous than the direct exposures that you have through the interbank market. Uh, finally, coming from a central bank, we are concerned about the implementation of the monetary policy stance, and you need a working financial, uh, working interbank market because without it you can't signal the price of liquidity. So if the interbank market breaks down and there's no proper pricing mechanism, we don't know how to implement monetary policy, which means we cannot control inflation. And while it's not the key problem right now that we might have too much inflation. In fact, here's, at the moment, it's the opposite problem. Um, it is, in a, as a function of the interbank market, it's one of the key things that we are concerned about. Finally, if you, if you have a market that breaks down, you do, you do not have any more pricing signals. So bad borrowers, people that take on more risk, are not disciplined by the market. They are not paying higher prices, and that creates incentives for them to take on even more debt, uh, even more risk. So the pricing mechanism actually is something that we would like to preserve, and market discipline is something uh, that, that we would also like very much, um, which probably was a problem in the run-up to the crisis. So all these four points um, make it clear why the interbank market has such a pivotal role in, in the financial system. And the big question from, from a central bank as a policymaker's perspective is, was there actually a freeze in Europe? There was unprecedented spikes in the, um, uh, in the price, uh, in the LIBOR OIS spread, so in the risk measures that we had at that time. But this is just a, a proxy based not on real transaction data. It's not so clear that this spike in, in the LIBOR OIS rate actually is reflected in the pricing and in the volumes, ultimately, that are traded on the interbank market. There are some theories saying it should, uh, but nobody so far had the data to actually have a look at 
what really was happening at the time. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a of a of a crime novel that we are doing, uh, trying to find out who are the culprits, what was going on, was anybody murdered, and why is there so much blood? If not, um, there's only one paper that that really <coughs> tries to do this to some extent using aggregate data, and that's by colleagues from the mm -hmm. Banca d'Italia. And what we want to do is we want to uh, we want to really go deep into uh, tick by tick transaction level data, what happened around Lima. That's the, that's the motivation, that's the whole story. So let me tell you, oh, let, me, let me make one additional remark why this is important. At the time where we ha uh, of the crisis, there was big concerns about the money mark, uh, interbank market freeze that uh, Jean-Claude Trichet, the previous governor of the ECB, expressed, given heightened concerns about counterparty risk, which intensifies dramatically after the failure of Lehman. Cash-rich banks, proved unwilling to lend to banks needing liquidity. As a result, the money market freeze came close to a total, uh, the money market came close to a total freeze. This fear expressed by, by policymakers at that time drove their reaction to the crisis. When you, I have a bit of a timeline later, many of the decisions that central banks took at that time were unprecedented. And uh, if, if there's something that central banks do not like, it's unprecedented or things that change. So that's usually, it's a, if, if they go there, it's out of deep discomfort and out of fear that something even worse might have happened. And that's exactly um, why we need more detailed data and more detailed information, this kind of study about uh, how exactly the interbank market works. Now, uh, we ask, was there a freeze in Europe? And we, we do three steps of our analysis. We start from the very aggregate perspective. How prevalent was counterparty risk concern at the time of the, of the Lehman insolvency, and did banks start hoarding liquidity? I'll tell you more as we go along in the talk, but just as, a, as, a, as, a, as an overview slide to tell you the different steps we are doing. What, we've, what we will find is that there was some significant changes in the, in the market dynamics, maybe not in the way that you would expect, but there were significant changes in, in the turnover, and we asked if this, if this change in turnover, if the change in liquidity reallocation uh, happens in an over-the-counter market, such as the interbank market, which is not centralized through one counterparty, so there's not the central bank or some, uh, some central clearinghouse sitting in the middle uh, intermediating all transactions. No, it's over-the-counter. I call a friend, um, tell him, listen, I've got 100 million lying around, don't know what to do with it, you want to have it? And then Stefano says, sure, um, I'll pay you this and this interest, and then we negotiate bilaterally. Uh, so this, this bilateral negotiation, these bilateral exposures, they imply a network structure of the interbank market. And it's a non-trivial structure, as I will show you. So what we ask in the second step of the analysis is, did the, did the aggregate changes in the turnover lead to structural changes? And then, as one particularly mean referee pointed out, even if there is significant change in the, um, in the network structure, so what? Do we actually need to worry about the network structure? Do we need to care about how banks are interconnected and how the, um, like if there's heterogeneity in their access to liquidity? So what we ask in the third uh, step of our analysis is does the position of a bank within the interbank network matter for their access to liquidity? Let me give you, before I go into details uh, um, of the results, let me give you a bit of an institutional overview because I think it's important uh, if we're doing a, an analysis of a period of time where many things happened at the same time. So, as you know, 15 September was the default of Lehman Brothers. It was the highest surge in interbank risk premia. I've grayed out some stuff that was not, not key for our analysis, like the ECB, Bank of England, Swiss National Bank, Fe, uh, Fed dollar liquidity provision um, was not key to, to the developments within the euro interbank market. But what was a key event was 29 September, when the ECB, in an historic move uh, for the first time, didn't conduct monetary policy through an auction. So this is how we usually do it. We estimate, based on autonomous factors, how much liquidity banks need. Then we ration them a little bit and let them fight it out about the rest. So they do it in auctions, and that's how the price for liquidity usually is implemented. Uh, 29 September was the first time uh, the ECB implemented a special term refinancing operation where banks could get as much liquidity as they wanted, provided they can uh, post uh, sufficient collateral. At the same time, also, the collateral framework was sufficiently broadened so that every bank could get as much liquidity as they want, um, as long as they can provide collateral that is not on fire. Since then, this last restriction has been lifted, and we take anything. Um, 
So that was the first time we, we did uh, full allotment monetary policy. On 15 October, there was a change in the regime of how monetary policy is implemented in the euro area. We moved to the full allotment, and that is truly an historic, an historic change, and the, uh, the new regime with the full allotment is still in place. And I will show you some of the particularly perverse consequences of this, of this change. Now, there's one slide that I think summarizes the paper. What we have looked at is we've looked at the turnover volume in different maturity segments. So we look at interbank loans that are in the overnight segment, just one day maturity has to be repaid tomorrow, carry not as much counterparty risk. Uh, they make up about 90% of the total turnover. So in terms of their overall volume, they are quite important. Um, and we look at all interbank loans in the term segment with a maturity of up to one year. So they make up 10% of the turnover, but if you have an average maturity of 200 something days, or in, the, in our case it's like 180 days, uh, you have 180 times 10%, so the actual exposure between banks is mainly driven by the term segments. So if you want to understand things like counterparty risk, you do need to look at, at term interbank lending. And one of, the, one of the things that came out of uh, a paper with Stefano and Tariq Rukni was that the, the network structure of the German interbank market, looking from different data, um, actually did not change very much in the past 12 years. So the question is, why is that? And the answer is because interbank loans, contrary to what, what some people believe, have a very high maturity. The average maturity, I, I, I checked that at some point in, in our data, of the German interbank, the average German interbank loan has a maturity of something like three years. So even if there is a crisis, you know, some minor glitch like a big U.S. bank defaulting. And even if you would want to unwind your position to the rest of the banking system, you cannot because of the maturity, because you are stuck in these positions. This is why the studies of contagion and, and debt rank are so important, because banks can't just change the interbank network structure because of the maturity. If you only look at the overnight segment, that is not a problem because banks then can adapt very quickly, but the, the maturity of the majority of the exposure between banks comes from the term. And that's something that, that has not been studied well in the, in the literature, and we do contribute to that. Now, the main results. Uh, when you look at the aggregate perspective, the, I think one of the key results from a policymaker's perspective is that the market freeze that we experienced was mainly a shortening of maturity. It was not a freeze in the classical sense. It was not that banks stopped lending altogether uh, on the days after Lehman. It was they stopped lending to each other in the term segments. So when you, when you look at the, um, at, the, at the red line, you see that the turnover and the first dashed line, 15 September, is Lehman. Turnover started dropping, and it's a total drop of roughly 50%. So that is sizable. But at the same time, you see that the blue line, the overnight segment, actually increases. So contrary to what banks were saying at the time, there was no dry up of interbank markets. It was just that you couldn't get liquidity in the term segments as much as you are used to, which means you have to actually make an effort and go to the market every day. Yes, it does increase your, your rollover risk, um, but it's not that you suddenly ran out of liquidity. In fact, the total turnover of the interbank market did not go down after Lehman. So there was no freeze in the sense that markets didn't completely stop functioning. The reason why we always thought this happened is because we had aggregate uh, quarterly data before our study. And that quarterly data shows actually at the end of, of 2008 a massive drop in interbank lending. So every policymaker looked at this and said, yeah, this seems right. This is, must be Lehman. When you look at it at the daily transactions and you follow the blue line, you see that with the implementation of the first special refinancing operation, with the implementation of full allotment, the ECB actually replaced 50% of the interbank market. So the, the, which is the reason why the first title we had for this paper was a three-letter inefficiency, but it didn't politically sound, sound the right, right bells. But what happened is that you have a market that, is, that has a disciplining function that is still working, and because you are afraid of counterparty risk and you don't have granular enough data, you think we need to provide liquidity, you push it into the market, you take on all the counterparty risk, you absorb all of this on your balance sheet as a central bank. And I turn had some... Uh, some, uh, some nice comments about this this morning. Uh, so we took on all that counterparty risk, completely replaced 50% of the market, which is massive. No pricing, no efficiency anymore. It's just central bank money going around. So 
And this was because we did not understand what caused uh, the, the, the crying wolf of banks, so to speak. This is what exactly what, what we look at. So it's not a freeze in the classical sense. It's not that the markets just dried up and all the liquidity was pff, gone. It was that banks shortened the maturity of their lending. And that's different from what the theory on, on money market freezes uh, has studied so far. Uh, the market dynamics in the overnight segment uh, were indeed driven by some counterparty risk concerns. So I, wa I as a bank, uh, was afraid that I might be rationed because of asymmetric information. And as a consequence, I stopped my term interbank lending. So if you have banks that have an intermediation function, let's say Deutsche Bank because it's the largest one, um, and you fear that you won't get overnight liquidity uh, from the market, you will stop providing term liquidity. And that, that it's, it's a perfectly rational reaction by the banks to this, to this particular concern. Um, but it's not that banks in the term segment feared they would, uh, they, they would be rationed because of counterparty risk. It's just that the market there, irrespective of counterparty properties, just dropped in volume. So banks started hoarding liquidity by uh, shortening the maturity of their lending, which is a novel mechanism and has not been studied in the theory literature on money market freezes. Now, in, on the structural perspective, what we find is that the euro area interbank network has a European core, Deutsche Bank, Banco Santander, Societe Generale. They are very heavily interconnected, uh, which is also in the, in the picture that Stefano showed. You could see there's kind of a cluster of banks all hanging together in the network structure, and that is true for the European interbank market as well. On top of that, though, we have in every country uh, a core periphery structure. So we have in Germany a couple of big banks being highly interconnected, intermediating most of the assets in the interbank market. So there's a, a large number of small banks that are not heavily interconnected that just lend through the core to one another. This is, these are the peripheral banks. We have this core, and then the core itself is connected through a European core. Um, which is why if the European interbank market would break up for one reason or exit another, uh, that, that actually would cause trouble in the, in the liquidity reallocation. Now, the best way to describe the structure and the dynamics of the structure around the Lehman insolvency is, is as a network shrinking. And it's in quotation marks because I've n I have not found a better term for it. But you have a, a network that has this large number of smaller banks and some small number of large banks, and suddenly the, the whole network just shrinks together, and you have fewer banks in the core, you have way fewer banks in the periphery that are active. So the whole structure experiences a very rapid uh, structural change. So then this, is, this begets the question, OK, network structure changes. What's the effect that banks will feel from it? So what we do is we econometrically study um, whether or not a bank's position in the interbank market matters for liquidity access. And I have, I have one slide where I show you a bit of motivation for it. But what we find is that, yes, banks that are more central in the system um, have easier access to liquidity because they can capture, so to speak, from a euro that passes from one end to the other within the system. It's easier for them to capture this one euro or get a hold of it uh, if they are very central because then there's more euros flowing through them. And this translates into... Uh, increased access to liquidity after the shock, uh, reduced prices for liquidity, so they make larger intermediation spreads, and they get more. So they get it more often, the liquidity, they get more of it, and they get it at cheaper prices. All of this, bec all of this because they have a relatively central position in the interbank network. So effectively what we, have, what we have done in this paper is we established that there is what we call an interbank lending channel of monetary policy. That's something that has not been studied in the literature before, um, because the data was simply not available. But where you are in the interbank market determines your funding liquidity. And when you think of the funding liquidity and market liquidity duality, and you know that there's a paper on how market liquidity um, affects your reaction to central bank policy, it's a very natural hypothesis to also assume that the same holds for funding liquidity. And this is exactly what we test. So let me be very, very brief on the literature. Basically, just give you like a few highlights. Um, I think there's one paper that's close to ours, and that's by colleagues from the New York Fed, uh, Gara Afonso, Anna Kofner, and Antoinette Shoah from MIT, uh, where they study the Fed wire market in the US, and they show that the, after the Lehman insolvency, the Fed funds market was stressed but not frozen, so there was some uh, increased prices, but there wasn't a, a total market freeze. What they do, however, is they study the overnight segment only, and it wasn't really clear 
what the reason for this weird behavior is, because you would think that especially the U.S. interbank market should have suffered much more given their direct exposure to Lehman and so on and so forth. Um, so it was very surprising why the U.S. interbank market didn't completely freeze, and our paper helps understand it because we now know that this is because banks were shifting their maturities and were shortening their, uh, the, the, the maturity. So what we do is we contribute to the literature on, on uh, liquidity hoarding and on asymmetric information and counterparty risk. Um, we also do contribute to the literature on financial networks, and I just cited a few papers here. There are, there are many, many more. It's, uh, uh, Stefano had two, two uh, calls for papers um, for financial networks conferences. I think there are at least three or four more, um, all of them with, with good journals. Um, the the follow-up conference to the IMF, one that Stefano mentioned, will be held this year at the BIS um, in October 1 and 2. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a renewed interest in, in networks and financial networks. Um, and what we do is we contribute to that by, sh by studying how the structure actually changes. So this is important for models of network formation, for all these dynamic network models. Um, and we also contribute to the literature on OTC markets. Um, so, very briefly, uh, on the data that we use, I mentioned that we have to resort to payment systems data. That's particularly nasty for, for a bunch of reasons. Um, it hasn't been cleaned before, so we, we do settle all those transactions through a payment system within the, the euro system. So technically we have those transactions, but we do not own them, because the ownership of, this, of these data is with the banks. Um, and that makes it difficult to access it even for central bankers. So it took many years of negotiations be before a group of people, and this, I think there was like 10 or so, who got access to study this kind of data. Um, it, Target 2 does settle 90% of all transactions between all European banks, so it's extremely granular. And the fear of the banks is if we know who has liquidity problems right now, we actually might try to make a fortune of it by shorting those banks or leaking this kind of market information. For each of the transactions, and we have 350,000 transactions a day, which means there's actually, we, we have data that is so large that it would require uh, methods from, uh, from big data analysis to really understand the full, uh, the full data set. For each transaction, we have the ultimate originator, the settlement banks, the date and time of the transaction, the ultimate beneficiary, and the amount. And that's important because of, because of one reason, because if you think about the way we reconstruct interbank lending from the raw data is by a very, very simple algorithm. You just check on a day any two transactions between any, any transaction between any two banks, so let's say A and B, and you, you check tomorrow, is there a transaction that goes from B to A with an implied interest rate that roughly could be an interbank loan? And that's the third transaction here. And then, yes, okay, this is an interbank loan. But now think about what happens if you go a year into the future. Every day we have 350,000 payments. So for a year from now on, we need to find all the possible rematches for this in initial transaction and then say, yes, this was an interbank loan. That's really messy, messy, messy data. Um, it took two years to clean it. And then we identified all those loans, but it's uh, like in an update that we are doing. We are now working with machine learning techniques to find patterns in, in payments in order to improve the, the quality if you go to, to loans longer than one year maturity. So this is how we construct interbank lending based on the, on the algorithm developed by Craig Furfine. We then split our sample in, in five periods. Uh, before the Lehman insolvency, we have an initial reference period. Uh, Monday and Tuesday is studied individually. Uh, we go to the post Lehman, the special refinancing operation, and then once we have adopted full allotment on 15 October, and the true novelty comes from the maturity that we have and that we can study. Now, I don't think I have too much time left. Okay. Ten minutes? Five? Minutes, five yeah. <laughs> then let me just, let me, just, I, I gave you the, the very executive summary of the results. Um, banks were sensitive to counterparty risk only in the overnight seg segment and as a consequence started hoarding liquidity. Um, in the term segments, they just dropped lending across the board. Uh, if you're interested in the, in the details, uh, the papers is, in, is on SSRN. So you, you will be able to download. Let me just give you one, in the last five minutes, just give me, let me give you one example why we think that the bank's position in the interbank network actually matters. And we have constructed like ridiculously simple network and we take a predefined measure uh, called betweenness. What betweenness does is it counts the number of shortest paths, 
when you have a network and you count, when you, when you drop in a euro in one end and you count the number of possibilities, it can go to any other place in the network. And then you take one bank somewhere and you find out how many of those shortest paths of liquidity transfer go through you. And that measure is, is called betweenness. Okay, so it just counts the number of shortest paths of liquidity transfer you are sitting on. So if you are on many of those, it's easy for you to get a hold of, of a euro that goes through and just take it and then take a decision whether or not to, to continue intermediation. So we think that the, we, we initially thought, okay, the bank's between us and we have a bunch of robustness results. That should matter uh, to find out how much liquidity banks can actually get. And if there's a shock and there's substantial aggregate change in the volumes, such as around the Lehman insolvency, this should matter. So what we then do is we, uh, we, we study the structural change. I will, I will skip all this because of, of time constraints. I will just tell you about the, the identification we do to find out whether or not the position actually matters. So there's a nice paper by Kwaya and Mian in, in the AER where they look at a Pakistani nuclear, uh, like a nu uh, atomic bomb test, which is a very nice exogenous event uh, that leads to uh, sanctions and a cut in the amount of liquidity Pakistani banks could raise on international markets, which is for an econometrician, this is awesome. Lehman is not as bad as this nuclear bomb, um, but it's best we got. Um, so what we do is we, we construct a very simple bank balance sheet. Uh, and the simplest possible bank balance sheet has on the liability side deposits, which fluctuate from day to day, uh, and bonds, which are uh, fixed throughout. So it's, it's like an amount of, uh, you can't just issue on, on very short notice new bonds, so it takes a bit of time. So we take an amount of funding that is fixed and banks invest it into loans. And we look at interbank loans. So what we now do is we restrict our sample to loans to banks that borrow from at least two lenders. So what, you, what this does is if you include borrower fixed effects in, the, in your regressions, you control for demand effects. And you know that all the changes in the allocated volume have to be from supply. And this supply is uh, because you have two banks that supply liquidity. You can look at the, at the change in their, um, in their deposit holdings. And our hypothesis down there is that the change in the deposits, the interbank deposits you, you get, is proportional to your position in the network. If you are central, you can get more deposits, even though there's a big shock. Um, and you can use this in a regression to show the following. Uh, to show that uh, there's a very large interbank lending channel, where a 1% reduction in the amount borrowed leads to a 2% reduction in the amount lent. So that's just something that comes directly from the intermediation, which is not dependent on the, on the network structure. It's just the volume that you borrow on the interbank market. You can also show that a 1% reduction in your number of counterparties, so from how many people you borrow, leads to a 0.2% reduction in the amount that you lend. And you can have a look at the betweenness, uh, and you can see that a one unit increase in the betweenness implies a 0 0.61 unit increase in the amount of liquidity provided. So the amount of liquidity provided is something in the order of, of tens of millions usually. Uh, so if you have a one unit increase in your betweenness in the interbank network before and after a shock, uh, that has a significant impact on the amount of liquidity that you provide. You can do the same with uh, the propensity to issue new loans or the, pro uh, the probability that an existing loan is rolled over after the shock. And you can also look at the, at the spread. So you can look at the intensive margin for the, for the intermediation spread. And you find confirming results all showing in the same direction. If you are very central, it's less likely that loans, um, that, that your interbank lending is cut because you don't have to necessarily. If you are more central, it's more likely that you get new loans after a shock and if you're more central, you get higher intermediation spreads. So this, is, this means that the strategically better network position translates into higher intermediation spreads, which is an important contribution to the whole literature on bargaining in networks um, that is now emerging. And just to, to wrap up, what we did is something that is a bit uh, complementary to Stefano's work about contagion. It's, we don't look, contagion is the most obvious thing to look for uh, when it comes to network structure, because the, the bilateral claims actually matter for the distribution of losses, and then we have debt rank to show us how equity losses in one bank would be spread within the system, even without default. 
But it's only one of the of, of the many ways that the network structure does matter. The the other way or the the other channel that we analyze is banks that are central in the network have it easier getting liquidity, and that's something um, that economists uh, can hardly ob or ha have a harder time objecting to because it's not about oh, but losses could be realized or. Um, if there was no central bank liquidity backstop, then this or that would happen. So we, we need to study alternative scenarios. No, this is actual impact on liquidity reallocation, which matters for uh, financial stability and monetary policy. We contribute to the whole discussion about uh, what are the appropriate emergency measures that central banks took at the time. And if we would have had that data in 2008, I'm, I'm skeptical that um, central banks would have provided as much liquidity. I'm skeptical that we would have provided uh, such a vast uh, support to the financial system. Uh, wasn't available. Now playing Captain Hindsight is always easy. Um, but I think it's an important lesson that, that, that we can learn from that data. Um, we show also, I, I didn't go into detail, but there's a structural dynamics that is different in the different maturity segments. So that's important for models of network formation. Um, and the final and, and, and the, the key thing really is that, um, and if there's one takeaway, I, want, I wanted to be this from, from the talk, and that is, yes, a bank's position in the interbank network empirically matters for the access to liquidity. And with that, I'll be done, and thank you. Thank you very much. Um, did you have a look at what the network was in terms of uh, how in your model, I mean, in, in ECB model, are uh, all members of a network equivalent? Or did you look at what uh, was the real exposures of each bank against the other ones when they were part of groups, of financial groups of banks? So, and if you did look at that, um, What's your answer to the, the differences between, uh, for instance, having a, uh, uh, this example was given to me by the uh, guy in charge of Baffin. I mean, you have a, a German bank and you have a subsidiary in Ireland and you have an exposure because you have vendors from um, Daimler Benz uh, 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 in Ireland. So how, in your model, that fits or doesn't fit, or was it looked that like? And uh, if you have answers to to that question. Yeah, we uh, because we have all transactions, we also know the counterparties, which means we know which transaction is within a group, a banking group, and which transaction is between banking groups. And what I've shown here is all extra group meaning exposures between banking groups. So all we, we have was consolidated on the group level. Um, we had a look, I uh, didn't speak about it, we had a look at intra-group transactions and you could see a shift from extra-group refinancing. Unicredit is my favorite example. When they kind of ran into trouble in Italy and, and had a hard time finding liquidity on the interbank market, what these smart guys did is they borrowed through the German subsidiary, People Finance Bank, and then extra-group and then put everything intra-group back to the Italian mother. And yes, Baffin did st step in and put an end to these shenanigans. Okay, I have a, a next question, sorry. Just, uh, uh, when you consider a bank as being part of a group, because this is one of the obstacles for LEI, uh, uh, at what level you considered it was one group? Just by the law, or just by the um, interest in the subsidiary? What level? Because it's, it's also a technical and regulation issue, which answer might be different from uh, the reality. I mean, it's, it's a very complicated, uh, that's why I have a question. I mean, I <laughs> Just very quickly, we looked at SWIFT. So we took the SWIFT identifiers, and SWIFT keeps the list of what they consider to be part of the same group. 
and we we can I'm happy to chat about the legal difficulties afterwards because yes there are plenty of of them uh but this is the easiest and cleanest identification that we could get so this is also for uh, Mr. Uh, Mr George um I think this is very interesting in terms of um finding this interbank channel but just anecdotally if you think about any all financial systems having hierarchies it's not a shocking surprise that a bank's location matters in terms of right there are core banks and there are periphery banks my question to you is what's your intuition about what is driving the location of a bank in the network is it merely scale is it just merely size um what is it that actually is the determinant or part of the a set of determinants that determines your location within the network and if it's just size then if i can just anecdotally look at any or informally look at any bank network uh, or, or, or banking system and say okay these are the core these are per the periphery banks that how would that anecdotal intuitive just roughly back of the envelope account differ from this very rich um network account um there's no direct correl there's some correlation between size and interconnectedness meaning the amount of counterparties that you have but it's not perfect this is why the uh, bis and their criteria for the systemic importance of banks emphasizes size interconnectedness and complexity whatever this means but distinguishes between the three so the question about what determines a position in the interbank network is very difficult because you can't determine your own position i can find my counterparts and i can play a game with them but if they play a game with a third guy the network structure can change in an instant so and i cannot control it so i don't know uh, because i can only control my direct counter like my exposures to counterparties but not the exposures of counterparties of counterparties or counterparties of counterparties of counterparties so i cannot easily strategically influence it now there is some inertia and there is some big banks being uh, at the center of the of the whole financial system this is this is definitely true but the correlation is not perfect and this is this is exactly why it's uh why it's important to study how large this effect is and how, how the cross section looks like um you mentioned before that you are operating with machine learning processes nowadays to um work better with the data I'd be curious about the outlook um, in terms of innovation that might come out of that. So, if you if you start operating with machine learning and maybe also with data science approaches, do you think you can develop instruments and mechanisms and algorithms that will allow in the future to maybe get a more precise idea how the network dynamics are and how they might eventually, which kind of different patterns they might show according to what kind of shock you induce in the system. Yeah so what we do with machine learning methods is trying to find out out of this vast ocean of data which of those are interbank transactions because we don't have legal entity identifiers or lux luxurious things like that we need to actually make an effort to find out what is an interbank loan what is a different type of transaction and so there are patterns monday morning for example deutsche bank could give a loan to societe generale every monday or every first of a quarter stuff like that these patterns are difficult to identify and machine learning methods help us to do just that so if we suddenly see there's a change in the pattern how they how they interact with each other that's an early warning signal that we could use but this is uh, the stage we had is 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 not sophisticated enough to say anything about it yet i think the the thing that stefano showed with this dash systemic risk dashboard from simple and uh, there's a couple of other tools now uh, that would have helped central bankers uh, seeing things a bit earlier ahead in the in the previous crisis but in all fairness i have i do not know a single central bank that has properly utilized it yet it's it's great that ecb does some uh some of the, uh, implemented some of of debt rank um but there we need much more of those tools and there there has to be there's lots of different problems involved from data standards to uh legal things like in germany it is a constitutional court ruling that you are not allowed to combine data that different departments within the same central bank have collected because of it's it's a, it's a very long very sad story uh that our legal department tries to to explain to us there's there's actual legal battles involved in combining data let alone studying it we had to discuss that the governor would be able to see those slides before they were cleared by the ECB and every central bank in Europe had to clear our slides basically and they argued that he's not allowed because he does not have the clearance 
So it's there's, there's lots of craziness involved, but I think things get better, um, and and technology definitely definitely will help us. So it's 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 great that we have projects like Simpol and and there's a couple of others uh, that that will help us in this regard. One quick question is a good segue into that. Uh, uh, it's it's a uh, good news to hear that you have actually um, that that we are we are overcoming this problem of, of identifying the second wave or the the uh, secondary effect in stress testing. Have you formed formed any opinion of what type of policy making uh, suggestions are born out of these uh, uh, tool making? Let's say. Yeah, Stefano. Yeah. So. There are, there are a couple of policy implications. Uh, I think that what we collectively, what we learn from the literature on, on financial networks, both the theoretical and the empirical ones, is that first of all, there is a core of um, tightly interconnected financial institutions and through different channels and different types of contracts. Um, there would be a whole parallel line of study that actually would look at derivatives and there is a <clears throat> nice uh, data set that is country study that is European Central Bank on credit for swaps in the among uh, the major European market players um, so I think that the one of the lessons that we, we we draw is first of all there is too much interconnectedness so of course that is improving at the individual level, risk diversification, but on the other hand, it comes with a social cost that the whole financial system is um, very highly interdependent, and then if something bad happens, then everybody is, 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 uh, is going to be affected. Uh, so the, the fact that the second order of effects, network effects, are as big as the, the, the first effect, means that whenever there is a shock on certain asset classes, let's say, for instance, um, on asset classes related to the price of housing, then, the, let's say, there would be a, say there is a 5% drop, and then not only the system is exposed through, directly through its own leverage to that asset class, but then there is the, is multi, the, the effect is then multiplied by the, the interbank leverage. So that shows that Either we put a cap on leverage, but also we should decoupling. We should be decoupling uh, part of the portions of the of the of the banking system in a way that is is more weakly connected. Because otherwise, we're going to have always ha have a a core that is strongly interconnected, and this will uh, spread contagion all over the place. So, both from a purely resilience perspective. And from a political economy perspective, I think that we have an interest in trying and uh, making the, the banking system more loosely connected and more transparent. Also because, I mean, I could discuss this, but essentially the complexity of instruments come with potential amplification effects due to information asymmetry and, and so on. So essentially now, from a practical perspective, how to achieve the the goal of, of uh, inducing a more loosely connected financial system? This is a very difficult question, and I don't have an immediate answer. I think that this has to be studied from a legal perspective and in terms of precisely incentives at the type of, you know, uh, uh, it has to do with a lot with the, with the legal settings. But I think that the first step should be that the objective should be, the policy objective should be clear, and it's not yet clear. I think that this conference is contributing a lot to uh, creating this awareness, and once, the, uh, one, once we will have a kind of consensus on, on this is a policy objective, then uh, we can have a more serious discussion on, on how to achieve it. I, I'm sure there are means to, to, to obtain that, or at least to facilitate that type of uh, decoupling. But first, the first big challenge, I think, is to have this uh, um, fully understood in, 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 its, in its full consequences. 
Um, if I may, um, okay, well, I, I just want to first give a, um, another uh, second answer, very practical um, to Stefano's uh, presentation. Stefano's presentation leads to a measure of the risk at the level of the whole system. Once you have a risk measure of the whole system, then uh, you have something, you have a, a, a side uh, consequence, which is the, a measure of the contribution to the risk of the whole system of every single uh, uh, institution. And as you know, regulation is about two things. I mean, it's about limitations in what you can do, what you cannot do, so all the legals, etc., and about amount of capital that you have to put aside for them. Now, if instead of looking at the capital as a risk that you are taking that was just, you know, the first round risk, but if you look at the capital as your contribution to the global risk in taking into account the second and third round, then you get a picture that is just precisely taking into account the interconnectedness and uh, the uh, also uh, the the, the, the potential impact, so the, your vertical uh, coordinate uh, in the, uh, on the system. So uh, basically, if banks are protected in terms of capital by their impact, that means that the day you have a, a, a systemic event, then as a whole, the system is able to react to the event. Uh, so the, this is uh, what you can, I mean, so maybe you want to, to, to comment on, 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 on this idea that uh, capital uh, ideally, no, I'm not saying it's easy, that ideally should be related to the contribution to the global risk rather than the, something proportional to your own risk as an individual. Yeah, there's been, there's a some stream of work on trying to, oh sorry. Yeah, there's been, uh, not by, by myself, but there's a stream of work trying to use this type of approach, including the debt rank, uh, to assess how much uh, contribution there should be for uh, from the side of each financial institution to a kind of a common systemic risk uh, mm -hmm. uh, fund. I did something fund. on this, I, uh, I think, yeah. The, um, yeah, there was also Ste mm -hmm. Stefan Turner and, and yeah. Sherry Marcoso were doing something mm -hmm. like that. But there were some questions. Yeah, Salim? Yeah, uh, Salim Demej, PhD student at Sorbonne University at Labeck and Labeck Sherifi. I have a question for uh, Batistin about uh, his graph where we see that uh, vulnerabilities are decreasing since 2008. And when we look at the data, we have banks that are more bigger than before and also interconnectedness uh, through derivatives, or, or also, which also increase so how will you explain that the second question so you may you may uh, build a new stress test uh, including the third uh, second and third uh, round defects and so would you look also at the liability side as uh, uh, Gorg show us that uh, funding uh, questions uh, matters so the ECB looked only at the asset quality review, so only at the asset side. So maybe it will be interesting to look at the liability side and at funding uh, issues. Thank you. Should I get that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't get it That's entirely. The, the, the first question, I think, so you were asking why is that uh, we see in the picture that I've shown that vulnerability goes down and uh, this is uh, maybe you got it better? I don't know. It, it, this seems to be, in, in your view, this is in contradiction with other data, but I didn't get, I didn't hear. Yeah. It seems to me that it's in contradiction with the, the fact that banks are bigger uh, after the crisis since there is measures and concentrations. So we have uh, bigger assets and also we have bigger exposition through derivatives. So how... Sorry, it's, um, I'm not sure it's entirely true. If you look at the exposures of the um, largest banks to derivatives, it went down after 2009. Actually, with Copia, we have a paper that was looking precisely at that. And it's going up again now, but um, it's certainly less than what it was at the end of 2007 for the largest, uh, for the largest bank, the exposure to derivatives. Now, as I said in the, during the presentation, 
our assessment does not look at the interdependencies through the derivative networks. And this is why I'm saying, I said, that the, the result that um, banks have been moving to the uh, uh, bottom left uh, quadrant should be taken with caveat, with, with, with care, because with caution, precisely because uh, risk might have been migrating to other channels. And we know that, you know, essentially, if the interbank market is shrinking, and then, of course, you get less impact over uh, when you simulate shocks on, on that, that, that market. But uh, maybe it's because banks are now borrowing um, either directly from the ECB, as, as, as Coupier was mentioning, and that means that there's been a shift of the risk to the, to the to European Central Bank. Yeah. Or because they are now using much more the repo markets, which are uh, uh, collateralized markets, and that in principle implies that there is less risk because for every loan now there is a collateral but that is only true if those the value of those collateral is completely independent of the of the banking system itself it happens that it turns out that in fact uh, part of the i've read some estimates i haven't done uh, that my, myself directly but something like 20 percent or so of the collateral uh, can be Tra traced back to it essentially it, it comprises corporate bonds of financial institutions that so that means that you know um, um, I'm asking you a loan and as a collateral instead of simply the unsecured uh, situation where I give you a piece of paper that I'm promised to pay back I'm giving you uh, a corporate bond that has been issued by Copier. now if our uh, defaults are independent then you are, you're, 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 you are collateralized. But in a systemic event, then my probability of default is going to be the same as, as, as Coupier's ones, and therefore that piece of paper, that, that corporate bond, is, is not worth more than my promise, the promise of myself. And then you said the other issue is about liquidity. I totally agree that the work that I presented is essentially focusing on the asset side, uh, and uh, that's what mostly is done in the stress test, but the liquidity hoarding channel, which is partly what, what Coupier has been, has been uh, uh, studying in his paper, it's also definitely very, very important, and the two mechanisms, actually, the contagion and the, and the liquidity hoarding, can work together and amplify each other. So there is some work in that direction in the literature already. Uh, I totally agree that that should be, um, could be incorporated. But, you know, I think that we should appreciate that there, there is, first of all, an, eff an, an effort in getting this type of approaches accepted as relevant. And then once you get it through in their simplest uh, formulation, then you can start discussing, ah, but there is also hoarding, ah, oh yes, and how do we deal with that? Yeah, and because there are frameworks, for instance, by Haldane and Kapadia, this, this journal of monetary economics paper, that is precisely looking at this contagion on the, on the liability side through hoarding. But, and it would be actually you know, very easy to implement a kind of stress test using that, but the, I think that the, the major challenge is first uh, getting people convinced that these network effects are, are, are there and are uh, sizable. Thank you very much. Um, so it's time to close this session to thank both the speakers and the attendees, especially those who raised those very good questions. And the chairman. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and I think we just have time for the last session of the day.